today we're going to be talking about uh, dynamic fees. Um, and I guess, show of hands, how many people have heard of uh, V4 and hooks? All right, how many people have built on hooks or like written solidity for hooks? Okay, so a handful of you guys. Um, cool. Um, so I'm Sauce, or Sauce Point. Uh, I do developer relations at the foundation. Um, I know a lot about V4, so if you have any like V4 questions, that's, that's me. And so today we're going to go into uh, dynamic fees and like how to do dynamic fees with hooks. Um, and before we start, we're just going to like quickly kind of touch on like the, one of the biggest changes in V4. And so in V3, there was originally three fixed tiers, uh, 5 bips, 30 bips, and 1%. Uh, governance voted to add one. Uh, so we have four, and those are sort of just the fees that you are sort of restricted to. Like LPs have to pick one of these. Um, in V4, this is now fully continuous, so you could have like 4.9 bips, you could have 10 bips, but uh, V4 also adds uh, dynamic fees, which is super flexible and super interesting. Um, these can be changed at sort of on any sort of spectrum, so like you could change it once a year, you could change it for the block, you could even do it at the transaction level, so for every swapper they could have possibly a different sort of fee that they pay. And uh, this logic is defined by the hook itself. Um, so it's like really any sort of arbitrary solidity. Um, you could, in theory, like look at the chain link oracle and dependent on if the price is above or below the, the Uniswap price, you could set your fee based on that. Um, so it's super flexible and like the hook has full control over how the fee is set. Um, but before we you know, go into that, like we'll just do a quick refresher on like how hooks work and what hooks look like. Uh, so whenever I say hook, it's kind of overloaded at this point. It's a contract, but it's also a function, and then it's also like a feature as well. Uh, so a hook is, so this is an example of like a hook contract. It's super bare bones. You sort of adhere to a certain function interface. And so in this example, we have like before swap. And so the logic inside that function will execute before swap happens. Um, in this case, we're just incrementing a number. It's pretty, pretty standard. Um, this is kind of what uh, hooks look like greater picture, where uh, at the start of the swap, we check if there's a before swap. If so, we'll run it. Then we'll do the, uh, the V3 sort of concentrated liquidity math. And then you can also do after swap as well. Uh, and you're not just restricted to the swap hook functions. You're, you could also do liquidity, like before and after liquidity gets modified, uh, before and after a pool gets created. Uh, just because you use before swap doesn't mean you're restricted to before swap only. You could use all 10 hooks that we have. Um, here's another picture of what hooks look like. Uh, so user does a swap, uh, touches the swap router, swap router then uh, connects to the singleton pool manager calling swap. And in this example, we have an after swap function. Uh, I would like to highlight that hooks, like the better hooks, essentially service uh, like all sorts of different trading pairs. It's not restricted to one trading pair. So in this example, you can see that like ETH USDC and UNI USDC work with, with this hook. Um, there might be cases where like your hook should be specific to like stable pairs. Um, but in general, one hook contract should service multiple trading pairs. That's uh, something worth calling out. Um, so now, yeah, uh, dynamic fees. Um, we're just going to go through like a super, super easy example, um, just so you guys are kind of familiar with like how it looks. And so if the block number is even, we're going to set it to 69 bips. If the block number is odd, it'll be cheaper. Um, I don't know why you would do this in production, but I don't know. It could be cool. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, so we have our hook contract, our hook function, uh, in the function set dynamic fee. This isn't like a standard interface, you can kind of name it whatever, you could provide whatever parameters you want. The only important thing that you really want to be aware of is uh, you essentially tell the pool manager saying like, hey, for this trading pair, for this key, this is the value, this is the swap value. Um, and then the pool manager will cache that value and then whenever you're running swap logic, uh, it'll you know reference the swap amount. Uh, and so if you wanted to do it on you know every single swap, you would just you know call this function before swap. So before every single swap happens, we'll just update the fee. Um, in this example, uh, there's actually this cool optimization where you could do because the fee is really only set at the block level. 
Um, and so you could really, you really only need to set the fee at the top of the block swap. So for the first swap that happens, you set the fee. And then for all remaining swaps within that block, there's no reason to update the value because you'd be updating it for the same thing. So that's a little small optimization that you could do. But again, like, yeah, you could do it every transaction. You could do it top of block. You could do it whenever you want. Like maybe you manually just call set dynamic fee from your wallet. Um, and then to showcase another hook, right, after initialize, uh, you can set the fee there because whenever you initialize a pool with a dynamic fee, its fee is actually set to zero. So if you're not updating it before every swap, you'll want to set it at some point, setting an initial value. So you could use the after initialize hook function. So pool gets created, a bunch of storage changes happen, it'll call into your contract in the after initialize, and then that's when you tell the pool manager that the fee is whatever value. Um, and so this is kind of, so there's a lot of back and forth with setting fees, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so user, you know, touches the swap router, swap router then calls the pool manager dot swap. Uh, inside the pool manager, it looks to see if we have a before swap function. And then in our case, we do, so then it'll call out to our contract. And then our contract will say, like, hey, the fee has changed, the fee is equal to um, whatever value you set it to, and then it returns back to the pool manager to run that actual like concentrated liquidity math using um, the new dynamic fee. Um, and really, that's that's all there is to it for dynamic fees. They're super simple, but also like hyper flexible. And I think I wanted to cover uh, testing here because right now V4 doesn't really have an interface, and like testing should be on like test nets locally or with. Uh, uh, Foundry unit tests. And so I'll just kind of quickly touch on it. And if you are thinking on building uh, for the hackathon, I highly recommend using V4 template. Uh, I have a link at the end. But essentially, it does all this really nice uh, code setup for you where um, we deploy the pool manager, we deploy all like the test routers, um, we create test tokens for you with all the approvals that you need. There's an example on how to deploy a hook within Foundry unit tests because um, yeah. hooks encode how they, like which functions they use inside their address. Like the first few characters of an address signal which functions you're using. And so there's this nice little like mining uh, tool that you can use within v4 template to deploy your hook locally. Um, also things that we do in setup is we initialize the pool. In this case you can see that uh, whenever you create the pool you need to have a special like fee value to signal that it's a dynamic fee. Um, and so there's a special flag for that, and we create that pool for you. Uh, we also seed some liquidity initially so that uh, you can kind of just jump right into it and like write tests for your, uh, for your hooks or for your dynamic fees. Um, in this example, we're sort of setting the block number to something even. We're running a test swap, and then we're confirming based on the output the number of tokens that we get if the fee was correctly charged. So on the even blocks, we see that 69 bips was charged, and then for good test coverage uh, on the odd blocks, we see that you know five bips was charged. Um, so that's a little note on sort of hook testing and verification, and definitely, definitely recommend using Foundry because if you do it on testnet, sometimes you get a reverted transaction that isn't very clear on like what went wrong. So uh, the unit tests are a lot better for uh, stack traces and stuff. And so now, yeah, for different ideas that I have around dynamic fees, because I have been saying that they're like super hyper flexible. Um, so you could do things like volume-based fees to incentivize like swap activity. So if like swap activity is down, like maybe the fee should be lowered. Um, you could sort of try to mitigate MEV or like front runners, um, which always prefer being like earlier in the block. And so you could do something where at the top of the block the fee is a lot higher, and then like later on in the block, or as more transactions happen, um, you could sort of decrease the fees that way. Uh, you could do sort of directional taxes for like meme coins and shit coins, where you know if you're dumping your shit coin, you you know you, you charge a higher fee to sort of disincentivize that. Uh, you could do fee discounts for liquidity providers for you know high volume traders. Uh, because, like I said, you could do fees at the transaction level and at every single swap level. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with AM, AMM. It's the new sort of auction AMM design from uh, Dan Robinson and Austin Adams, where essentially they auction off the rights for somebody to set the dynamic fee. Like you're, you as a bidder will bid 
to be able to set that dynamic fee. And so some sort of variant of that sort of applies here. And then lastly, uh, the VRGDAs from T11s where, you know, you kind of have like this like decaying auction that can also increase in price as well, dependent on like demand and volume. Um, so those are some cool ideas related to uh, dynamic fees. And then quickly on prizes that we're offering at the foundation uh, this weekend. Uh, so we're offering three prizes for what I call first class hook features. These are things that are supported like really well and like natively within V4 hooks. So dynamic fees is an example. You can do custom curves in V4. It's a little bit messy right now because there's a pending change and I only recommend it for the brave. Uh, but it is possible, and if you are interested in custom curves, come talk to me. Uh, you can do no op. Uh, you could have hooks charge their own fees or do sort of different like value redistribution uh, using hook fees. And then in the other category, we have hooks and external integrations, where you know you can combine a hook with like maybe a zk coprocessor or combining you know v4 hooks with Worldcoin um, to sort of you know change the dynamics of swappers and LPs. And so we're offering prizes for that. And then the last track is just kind of like this open track where if you're not developing a hook directly, but you're you know, integrating or doing something tangential to V4 that will apply to you. So anything on like MEV, Lever, Just In Time. Uh, on the public goods stuff, uh, there's like Oracle hooks that are cool. Uh, liquidity staking or like liquidity incentives on V4 haven't been built yet. And then lastly, we have like pool operators, which are like, uh, for free contracts slash like swap routers, like you could like maybe design a contract that does atomic arbitrage and a portion of the proceeds get donated to liquidity providers or something like that. And yeah, so those are the three tracks and the three prizes. Um, here are the resources. Um, there's, so all that dynamic fee example exists on, under my repo, uh, SaucePoint on GitHub. The template is under the Uniswap Foundation, highly recommend using that. And then we have uh, V4 by example, which is, I don't know if you've guys seen it, but it's a fork of uh, Solidity by example, where we have a bunch of nice little uh, snippets and um, different sort of uh, Solidity snippets related to, to V4. You know, there's you know, information on swap fees. If you're you know, lost on like, how do you create liquidity, there's you know, examples and Solidity snippets for you to work through. Um, I don't think this is reloading, but uh, yeah, that's all I had. I am SaucePoint on Twitter and on Telegram, so feel free to reach out to me, and then you know I'll open up uh, the floor for any questions if anybody had any questions. Yeah, message dot sender. Um, there used to be a really good way, but then Labs ripped it out. Um, conveniently, it's here on on before by example. So within hook functions, there's, uh, you have an option to provide like arbitrary call data. And so this arbitrary call secure, data. Though. W would that not be secure though? Because like then the user could just pass in some arbitrary value and then. Yeah, yeah, there's like, I mean, I guess you could write a uh, periphery contract that like guarantees that, you know, the message sender gets uh, okay. passed to the hook. But yeah, this is, Currently, really, the only way to access like the wallet's address at the moment. So the lock, there's like some sort of function that's like dot lock. Um, yeah, you can't call dot lock from wallets anymore. Okay, you used to perfect. be able to, and then that information would get provided to the hook. But okay, I think they took it out for like gas reasons. Mm -hmm. um, well, cool. If there are no other questions, um, I think we're just about on time. All right, great. Thanks, guys.